Uh, so first of all, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Akram Khatir. I'm a professor of history here at North Carolina State University, where I also serve as a director of the Moiz Khairallah Center for Lebanese Diaspora Studies. So thank you for joining us today for this episode of Tarikh, our webinar series which we, where we explore the history of Lebanon and its diaspora through conversations with outstanding scholars. In these discussions, we hope to gain deeper insights into Lebanese history in all of its dimensions, be they political, economic, cultural, environmental, or social. Our focus will be primarily on the modern history of Lebanon across the 19th and 20th centuries, but we'll certainly make forays into earlier periods as well. If there are particular topics that you would like to hear more about, then please let us know by emailing us at Lebanese studies at ncsu.edu, and we will be putting that in the chat. Uh, before we go on to our uh, thing, I'd like to share with you our mission statement, just so you have an idea for those of you who have not encountered the Khairallah Center. Uh, and as you can see, our mission is to preserve and share the history of uh, Lebanese immigrants throughout the world. And to probably give you a better idea about that, I'd like to share with you a very brief... <laughs> Now, uh, on behalf of the center, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on the Nahda period in the history of Lebanon and other parts of the Ottoman Empire. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Osama Mahdisi, uh, who is a professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley. In this conversation, we will explore a period in Lebanese Ottoman history and really a history of al-Mashriq, by which uh, al-Mashriq we mean anything in the Arab world in terms of Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, uh, and uh, Jordan, and sometimes we include Al-Iraq as well. Uh, so a period in the history, and then in where we have thinkers, intellectuals in Bilad Sham began to imagine, discuss, and implement a new and secular political order to replace the old Ottoman system. Again, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Mukhtasi or myself during the discussion, please type them into the question box in your Zoom pa uh, control panel. And Ms. Bailey Brown, who is uh, our tech support today, will help us address as many of you as possible. And basically, the format that we're going to follow before I introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Mukhtasi is I'll, uh, I'll introduce him. Uh, then we'll have a series of questions that I'm going to pose to him. But I would, I'd like to do, you know, probably have he and I will have a conversation for about 30 minutes. Uh, but then after that, certainly we would like to open it to Q&A. So again, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in order to enter questions and we will try to get it to as many of those as possible. And we'll try to also, if several of you ask similar questions, we will try to group them singularly. Now I'm really excited uh, to introduce Dr. Osama Mukhtasi, who, as I said, is a professor of history and the chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Mukhtasi's most recent book is Age of Exist uh, Coexist Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World, and that will be the center piece of our conversation today. His previous books include Faith Misplaced, The Program Promise of U.S.-Arab Relations, Artillery of Heaven, American Missionaries and the Failed Conversion of the Middle East, 
which was a winner of multiple awards, and The Culture of Sectarianism, Community, History, and Violence in 19th Century Ottoman Lebanon. He has published widely on Ottoman and Arab history as well as on U.S.-Arab relations and U.S. missionary work in the Middle East. Among his major articles are Anti-Americanism in the Arab World, an Interpretation of Brief History, which appeared in the Journal of American History, and Ottoman Orientalism and Reclaiming the Land of the Bible, Missionary Secularism and Evangelical Modernity, both of which appeared in the American Historical Review. Usama, welcome to Tariq and welcome to the Khairullah Center. Thank you so much, Akram. Um, it's uh, really great to be with you and uh, to be at the center virtually. Um, I wish it were in person, but uh, honestly, I'm really impressed with the work that you've done and, and really grateful to you and to all the staff um, for, for this kind of extraordinary archival and, as you said, creative work that you've enabled um, in this and in, in through the center. So thank you to you. Thank you so much, Osama. I really appreciate you saying that. <laughs> so uh, as, I, as you and I discussed before, I really want to start out with a very simple thing. Our audience is a mixed group of people, undergraduate, graduate students, as well as scholars and the general public. So before we get talking about your book, what I really wanted to do is ask you a question, if you can reflect a little bit and share with us how it is the path that took you to become probably one of the preeminent Middle East historians today. Well, um, I mean, I think I, 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 as, you, as you know, I grew up in Lebanon during the war and the civil war in Lebanon. And I think as a result of that, I was sort of motivated to um, to pursue sort of, I knew that I knew that the the reality that I lived and experienced, and that many of us lived and experienced in Lebanon, was not reflected in the way the war was was represented or reported as simply a Muslim Christian conflict. You remember that the way the war was always represented in binary terms, and I knew that the history was the or the reality of the present was much more complex, and uh, that sort of spurred me into uh, doing history. Um, at a time, as you know, Akram, when when the uh, you know I'm privileged because my parents, of course, are both academics, uh, writers, thinkers, and so in that sense, it's sort of um, it, the, the um, uh, they they always encourage me to pursue my sort of passion in history, and so I ended up going to the U.S. and and majoring in history in college, and and from them, um, and thinking about sectarianism really, and thinking about the representation. Of our part of the world as as a place that is that is you know mired in endless religious uh, fanaticism, uh, and I knew that was wrong. Uh, I knew that that needed to be historicized, so that pushed me to to go into history. Um, why the Middle East uh, is because I guess because I grew up in the region, and because I you know I feel attached to the region. Thank you so much, uh, Osama, for that. Uh, so let's shift a little bit more specifically about uh, your latest book, The Age of Coexistence. I'm kind of curious, what was the impetus? You know, I mean, this kind of feeds a little bit as a good segue as well in terms of this book. So, I, But I'm kind of curious, what really led you to this book and writing it? Well, I mean, this is tied to, um, I mean, again, as I say in the beginning, sort of every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence in the sense that that we you know we live in a part of the world that's got an extraordinarily rich history uh, as you know as a historian um an incredibly complicated history a beautiful history in many ways um and yet a history that is that is typically represented in a one dimensional manner of as i said fanaticism sectarianism religious uh, activism hatreds and so on and so forth and i wanted to give people a sense that um uh, uh give people a sense that that there, there's a, there's an entire history of coexistence uh, in in a in a complicated uh, but but meaningful uh, way that needs to be excavated needs to be remembered and that is today either denigrated or forgotten or denied and I think it was really important for me to 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 turn the narrative around from from simply saying we're not like this to saying this is what we're like in other words to go from rebutting stereotypes. Orientalist stereotypes, or um, you know, racist stereotypes, or or chauvinisms, and so on, um, or or to to basically um, uh, to to go from that to to representing something I think more positive, to tell a more positive story, sort of along the lines of the Khairullah Center, to to go from to go from sort of uh, uh, documenting a past that has been denied uh, or ignored or forgotten, and then narrating that past in ways that sort of defy what, what many of us think about our 
our contemporary reality, which is to say that we're heirs to a profound history of coexistence, a dynamic history of coexistence, a history that, that especially along Muslim Christian lines, that is extraordinarily important, um, but that uh, has to be sort of remembered and, and historicized and narrated because it's, it's something that we should be proud of collectively, but also we should be critical of as well. I mean, the combination of, I think that's in a very general sense, that's what I would say, sort of pride in, in, in not pride, I don't, really, I, don't, I don't want to sound chauvinistic, but sort of uh, an awareness of the importance of narrating this history in, in more positive terms, and at the same time being always aware of the need to be critical. So that combination. Uh, thank you for that, for that answer. So let's delve a little bit into the book. Uh, and to give people a better idea about what you're focusing on and some of the histories that you have unearthed and reconceptualize and reframe. So the book is really two parts. The first part really deals with the late Ottoman period, uh, which you define as, you know, the 1840s, uh, 1860s, all the way up to World War One, And then we're moving on to the mandate period in which Britain and France uh, take over what we know today as the Middle East and or at least participate in subdividing it into nation states. So let's talk about the first part. Uh, now, the first part, as I said, focuses on the late Ottoman uh, Empire and the transition away from a system of Muslim privilege and, quote, deep formal inequality, end quote, which you argue led to the intellectual and political uh, ecumenical frame, this idea of an ecumenical frame. So I found that to be an incredibly engaging uh, two words, actually. The ecumenical part and the frame part, for me, were a very engaging way of uh, telling the story. But I'm wondering if you can um, tell us a little bit, what is the ecumenical frame and how does it revise Orientalist understandings of sectarianism? Well, the ecumenical frame is just my way of talking about a history of coexistence between Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, within Christian communities, within Muslim communities, within Jewish communities. There's an extraordinary religious diversity in our part of the world. And our modern history has been the attempt to try to transform, to recognize that diversity, to embrace that diversity, uh, and to accept the reality of difference, religious, ethnic, communal, sectarian difference. And then to figure out ways of transcending. I mean, that's that's the history of the 19th century. How do people transcend that difference without actually ignoring or denying that difference? That's the ecumenical part. In other words, you just like in, in Christianity and in Islam, you can be uh, ecumenical if you're Muslim and say you accept Sunnis and Shias together and you transcend that difference because you recognize the commonalities being Muslim. Same with Christians. You can be Protestant, Catholic, and so on in many different sects of Protestantism. And you can transcend these um these differences because you recognize that there's something that you agree on more fundamentally which is you know in the christian case jesus christ and god and so on and so forth that that same idea i'm taking that idea and adapting it to our part of the world to say that we recognize difference we embrace difference we don't try to ignore or erase difference and make everyone the same but we also there was an attempt in the 19th century and at an ottoman level but then also at an arab level and even at a Lebanese level, to, to sort of transcend religious and ethnic difference and sectarian difference and, and focus on the commonality, but without erasing, without erasing difference. I think the key here is that we're not trying to, it's not like the French or others who say we're going to erase everyone's sort of religious you know, being and sort of you're going to be just one thing. We don't have that. So the idea of the ecumenical is the idea of accepting religious difference sectarian difference, communal difference, and at the same time transcending it. That's the ecumenical part. The frame just is a reference to the, the idea that we live in an Ottoman, we lived in an Ottoman environment. And the frame refers to the political frame, it refers to the cultural frame, it refers to the fact that the scaffolding upon which uh, our, our culture of coexistence, our modern culture of coexistence developed, uh, depended on this, this sort of environment, the political, legal um, social environment that that nurtured and that allowed for the development of very new ideas of being Ottoman, being Arab, being Lebanese, etc. So and being Syrian in ways that help people transcend religious difference. So the, the, the framing is crucial because we really our our development, our modern history of coexistence is really this point 
between an older history of coexistence, which was a, the, the older Ottoman model, the older Islamic model, which of course recognized religious difference, but but in an Islamic imperial polity. So there was there was there was coexistence, but there wasn't equality. The challenge, of course, is what happens in the 19th century. How do you transform that old system with its important legacies, its contradictions, its tensions, and so on and so forth? How do you transform that into a modern system? How do you how do you take difference, recognize difference, and also then develop an idea of equality? That was the challenge of the 19th century. And I think in the Arab provinces, in places like Beirut, in Cairo, in uh, Damascus, in, in other parts, in Jerusalem, and other parts, uh, Haifa, and, and other parts of, of, of the Ottoman Arab East, there was a, an explosion of writing and thinking and teaching in the 19th century that emphasized this idea that we could both be Muslim and Christian and Jewish and at the same time be Ottoman or be Arab. That, that's that's what I was referring to. So so let me follow up on that. So what was driving this at this particular historical moment? Because one of the things you 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 do very well in this book, as in other books, is to historicize these moments to say this is not an immemorial way of being that this region we call the Middle East is as historical as every other region. So what is driving it at this moment that we see what ultimately we come to call the Nahda period, uh, yeah. this kind of Renaissance, you know, uplift. Yeah. Uh, that what's driving it, what's driving it, to imagine this sorry go ahead well what's driving it is, is is i mean it's a combination it's a dialectic it's both i mean what's driving it is both circumstances politics economy culture the entire sort of world in which people were living uh, there was huge amounts of change in the 19th century the ottoman empire was uh, subjected to massive external pressures napoleon's invasion of egypt in 1798 the greek war of independence in the 1820s uh, culminating the establishment of a Greek kingdom, the uh, the, the rebellion of Muhammad Ali against the Ottoman um, against Ottoman rule, and so on and so forth. There were massive pressures on the Ottomans, and that the Ottoman state, in other words, and that forced them to embark on on what historians refer to as the Reformation, the Tanzimat, or the reordering of the empire, uh, which 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 tried to change the empire from being an empire of subjects of unequal subjects to being an empire of citizens. It's a paradox. It's in that moment in the mid 19th century that allowed the space to develop for um, the idea of thinking, okay, so what does it mean to be an Ottoman citizen? What does it mean to be modern? What does it mean to, to, to be civilized in the 19th century? So these are the ideas and these are the context and the moments that, that, that the, the major frame, it's the Ottoman state and the laws of the state and the reformation of the state that allowed people locally on the ground to uh, start thinking in, in extraordinarily creative ways uh, and new ways about, okay, so how do, we, how do we update our, and how do we transform the legacy that we have, the history that we have of coexistence and sort of adapt it to the world that we want to build, a modern world. So that's, that's a, at a very broad level. Then locally, you have specific examples. I talk about this in the book, of course, you have uh, in, in reaction to this, this huge transformation. And the point I make in the book, Akram, as you know, is that we should stop thinking about, we should stop being ashamed of our history uh, as Lebanese, as Arabs, as, as people from the, from the region, whether we're Arabs or not Arabs or Lebanese, or it doesn't matter where you're from, we shouldn't be ashamed of the history. There are contradictions, there are tensions. There, there were sort of, um, there were moments that, that today we look back and say, oh, well, they were pretty awful moments. Um, including, of course, there were people who were opposed to this change. There were people who had vested interests in the old system. And there were economic dislocations in the 19th century. There was a lot of political pressure on the Ottomans. And among the, the, the things that occurs is the first major anti-Christian riot that takes place in Damascus in 1860, in July of 1860. And there are economic reasons for this. There are political reasons for this. We're not taught this history, of course, in, in, in Lebanon or in the Middle East in general. Uh, I doubt we're taught this, this, these kinds of histories because it was a, a, a major riot, but it's 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 a riot that takes place in a context of this of these dislo dislocations, of the economic transformations, of political interventions, of massive pressures on Ottoman sovereignty, and there was a backlash. And so the 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 uh, the and and so historians, especially Orientalists, have looked at these moments and said, "Look, you see, uh, Muslims attack Christians." That means Muslims can't be modern. And the reality is, of course, is that it's not all Muslims who attack, it's some. Uh, 
So we need to contextualize. And many Muslims protected the Christians in Damascus. And, and more to the point, out of this terrible moment in July of 1860, out of this terrible moment uh, uh, of, an, of a sectarian urban uh, massacre or riot, there were people like Butrus al-Bustani, an educator, a thinker, um, uh, um, uh, uh, a reformer who was living at the time in Beirut, who basically realized that the, that the region as a whole, Syria, he called it, because then, of course, there was no state of Lebanon, there was no state of Syria, this was all under Ottoman sovereignty. He realized that the region was at a crossroads and that, you know, in the, in the midst of these huge transformations, as the empire was trying to go from being an empire of subjects to being an empire of citizens, uh, at a time of massive European interventions, at a time of, of, of um, uh, pressures, at a time of sectarian riots, people had a choice to make, just like today, people have a choice to make. They could either give in to their sectarian sort of uh, prejudices, or they could, or they could inculcate a new way of being, a new way of thinking about their religious heritage and their sort of diversity. And so, what happens is that is that he then uh, really opens the first school that I'm aware of, the first school in the Ottoman Empire, that is uh, an ecumenical school that really sort of says you can be whoever you want to be. You can be Muslim, Christian, Jewish. You can be anything you want. And you should know your own history, but at the same time, you're part of a, of a greater uh, you're part of a greater community. And so he he and he he develops a school called Al Madrasa Al Wataniya in eighteen post eighteen sixties in the eighteen in the early eighteen sixties, and it's an extraordinarily important school. It's an extraordinarily important moment. He's recognized by the Ottoman state, who who say this is exactly the kind of 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 uh, uh, of new education and new being that we want to cultivate. So my point is, it's a choice that we all make. Do you do you give in just like in America today? Do you give in to your worst impulses and say uh, you know and you see in you see in diversity danger, or do you look at diversity and say you see opportunity and you see potential for building something greater than the sum of their parts? And again, Bustani among many others embraced this moment and said there's an opportunity in the mid 19th century to develop a greater sense of who we are as a community that transcends religious difference without denying religious difference. Uh, so I'm going to follow up a little bit uh, on that, but I just wanted, because you mentioned that Madrasa al-Wataniya, which we usually translate as a national school. Uh, and here is kind of, it's a larger question. Uh, both al Bustani and others who are thinking, you know, who are part of these societies and, uh, communities uh, of thinkers who are trying to develop new ways of being. Uh, are they thinking outside the frame of the Ottoman Empire? Because we use the term national. So I kind of want to, or are they thinking that they are part of this Ottoman Empire and they're reshaping it from within? I mean, how are they imagining at this point their their political future, so to speak? Well, someone like, I mean, again, that that is a context. You have to be, we have to be very specific and contextual because it depends on the person. It depends on the context. It depends on the city. It depends on the moment. But in the case of Bustani, for example, he was thinking himself both as an Ottoman and as a Syrian, uh, as an Arab, in other words, both. Uh, and he didn't see a contradiction between the two. So he was absolutely a, a subject of the, uh, and eventually a citizen of the empire, for sure. I mean, he didn't see himself as politically separating from the empire, as opposed to the Greeks and the Serbians and others who were separating from the empire. He didn't see the, you know, he wasn't presenting an alternative political sort of project in that sense. But he was also way ahead of, of the Ottoman statesmen, because the Ottoman statesmen are reforming to maintain the integrity of the empire. So equality is just is just a, a means to their goal, which is to preserve their empire. And that's the that's the ultimate goal. So if if something else comes along that's more important, they'll do that to preserve the empire. They'll get rid of equality if if it means preserving the empire, whereas Bustani was really an individual, an educator, as I said, a reformer, a pedagogue, and he was he was much more invested in the idea of of actually developing a new consciousness, of being a Syrian that sort of trend, which of course is still important today, a Syrian that transcends religious difference, that embraces religious difference, but also transcends it. So I think it's it's both. He was both an Ottoman, but also an Arab Syrian. Uh so I'm kind of also curious because, uh, as you note in your book, a lot of the uh, these individuals who are formulating this new frame, uh, 
uh, like with Rasul Bustani, are also ones who are very class conscious, not in terms of social, only socioeconomic, but in terms of intellectual pedigree. And so they see that, you know, there is kind of this subclass of people who are illiterate, ignorant, you know, and violent, and then they themselves as the enlightened ones. So aside from that kind of bias that is inherent, that I'm kind of curious, as you were doing research and looking into this, what role did women, did peasants, did working class people have in shaping this ecumenical frame? Not necessarily, obviously, in sitting there writing, perhaps, although they may have, but more importantly, in terms of imagining something different. Well, I mean, obviously, women, it, it goes without saying, that women are absolutely uh, an essential part of the ecumenical frame, both in terms of, uh, both in terms of, of course, being sort of, uh, obviously like a, a, a massive part of, of the very communities that we're talking about and the fact both in other words as objects of education but also as agents of education mm-hmm. as agents of of of, of uh, people who are mobilizing in their own right in the 19th and 20th century developing uh, and thinking through about again what is the role of what is the role of of, of, of women in this society what is the role of what is the role of mothers what is the role of 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 uh, women in the nation and so on and so forth. These were all sort of massive vital debates that were taking place. And of course, there were just like with Bustani, there were people who were more conservative, people who were more, I would say, let's say more uh, more liberal or people who were more secular, people who were more pious um, at every level, men and women. Um, and there were major female, women educators, journalists, thinkers, writers, um, and so on. So. You're right to point out that in the book, I do focus on intellectuals because the point that I, that I make is that in the book is that uh, it was in schools and in in journals and schools, and newspapers and books that you see the, the most obvious and the most uh, evident sort of expressions of this, this new ecumenical identity. But of course, eventually what happens is that these people want to reach out and do reach out in many instances and the state reaches out in turn to sort of what you call other other classes. Um, and they're all affected by the laws of the empire. Uh, but of course, the priorities are different depending on what your class is, what your position is, what your work is, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, these people did, of course, have bias. Mustani had bias. But I think we should also be, we should be wary of this Akram. We should sort of, again, because it's, it's, it's a common thing in American academia to say, oh, these people are elitist, you know. Today, Bustani is an elite. I mean, what does it mean to say he's an elitist? I mean, yes, he may be an elitist at one level, but he's not. He's not the sultan. <laughs> There's a different level of elite. I mean, uh, he he is, after all, a convert. You know, he was a convert. He did work as a printer. He worked in a press. He worked as a translator. So you know, he wasn't a, a, a rich man to, to in in that sense of being elitist. And his sense and his sense his his intellectual project was in fact revolutionary. It was a revolutionary project and a really important project. So I think we should be, uh, we should all, of course, always be aware of the class and the the social dimensions of all these individuals. But we also should be wary before we start throwing out sort of terms like elitist, because we use that as a way to avoid actually delving into the actual their thought. I mean, so Rousseau is also an elitist, and Hannah Arendt is an elitist, and by the same token, you see what I'm saying. All these intellectuals are elitist, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take their thoughts and thinking and writing seriously. Of course, and the same our, in our part of the world too. And we often we often immediately go right away to say, okay, let's find the authentic sort of the authentic Easterner, the, 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 and and as if these people are not authentic in their own right. Oh, absolutely. So let's situate this argument that you're presenting into the larger debate. So in the past decade or so. Uh, some scholars of the Middle East have uh, deeply critiqued secularism as a quote unquote Western import, uh, mm-hmm. whose ideological tenets and praxis stood at odds with the local histories uh, and traditions of Middle Eastern societies. In the age of coexistence, your book, uh, you argue for a different approach, one in which secularism has multiple genealogies, including a local one in the 19th century. So I was wondering if you can elaborate. And yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not just, of course, it's not just scholars, uh, you know, of the Middle East in America who have made this argument that secularism is somehow a foreign import. It's also people in the Middle East, especially the more religious and conservative types who've made this argument time and again, that, that secularism is simply a Western import. And the reality is, of course, secularism, like many, many, many other ideas uh, are, are, are circulating around the world. 
and have different expressions. Um, and in our part of the world, the point about the, the reason again why I go back to the ecumenical part is, is, is to insist that as people are, are grappling with what does it mean to be Ottoman? What does it mean to be Arab? What does it mean to be civilized? What does it mean to be a modern man or a modern woman in the Ottoman context or in the post-Ottoman, the immediate post-Ottoman world? There are, there are people who are in fact secular who gravitate towards secularism. There are people who gravitate towards piety. There are people who gravitate towards religious expression. There are religious people who also insist on a secular political frame. And there are, you see what I'm saying? There's a, there's a whole range of expression. And so the idea of saying that the secular people are mimicking the West misses the point completely. It's like, that's, to me, that's an irrelevant, that, 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 that criticism doesn't make any sense because it doesn't actually take into account the actual histories of people on the ground, their feelings, their ideas, their worldviews, their ambitions. And to me, that's much more important than, than, than frankly, whether or not secularism originates in the West or doesn't originate in the West. That's not, for me, a very interesting point. It, it goes back into this point of like what is authentic. And the point is people borrow from all, many different things from all parts of the world. And, um, and, and so too are part of the world. And that, that's, I'm more interested in seeing how do they take these ideas and how do they, how do they go with these ideas? How do they elaborate these ideas? I mean, you could say the same thing about equality. In fact, I was just at a, at, 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 at a on the East Coast. I won't go into too many details, uh, but the um, uh, person was basically pushing me to acknowledge that equality is a Western idea. And you know, again, this is such a like an old-fashioned, uh, um, um, unproductive way of thinking about equality. So I told them, look, the historian, a good historian. He wasn't a historian. A good historian would basically say, rather than say, what is, is equality Western or Eastern or whatever, why not just say, look at how the, the look at how the principle of equality and citizenship emerges in the 19th century and how it is contested in very different contexts and how people fight for it and are and, and people fight against it in America, in the Middle East, in Europe. You know, in India and so on and so forth. You see what I'm saying? And like the point is, like, look at that. That's a much more productive way. And the same for secularism. So, the the secularism versus Islamism, you know, versus piety, just again is a debate that takes place in the Middle East, as other parts of the world. And and the point is to understand that there's a the, the, there's a range of of ideas and beliefs. And the point about the ecumenical frame. Finally, the last point I'd like to make on this is that. Whether you were a secularist or you were an Islamist or you were a Christian a fundamentalist or whether you were a liberal, a pietist, whatever you were, all these people, the, this is the crucial part, all these people, all these people, these individuals in the 19th century uh, uh, Arab East in particular, understood that they lived in a diverse world and that there was no getting beyond this diverse world. That's the crucial point. So it's not about, uh, and so some said, of course, it's more authentic to be X, it's more authentic to be Y. That's in the nature of, 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 a, of a vibrant living culture and society. People debate these issues. But the point is they didn't negate each other. That's the crucial bit. In our part of the world, in the Arab East, in the Masjid, under Ottoman rule, this is the crucial part in the book also. We did not develop ethno-religious nationalisms in, in the Masjid al Arabi, in the Arab East. We did not. We, in fact, in fact, more so than even, I'll say, the Ottoman state, we embraced this idea of Ottomanism and inhabited it and embodied it in all the debates and the diversity and all that stuff. So, but we didn't develop this idea that that the state, that the, the, the Masjid only belongs to community X or community Y. We didn't have that. And that's, again, part of the richness that we need to remember and recover. Thank you so much for that eloquent answer. Uh, I wanted to shift to the second part of your book, but before I do that, we have a couple of questions that pertain to the first have, and I thought this would be a good idea to at least open them up here. Uh, so we have one question that says, practically speaking, do you see the ecumenical frame ever fitting within the shape of the modern nation state, or are they effectively incompatible? Well, it depends on the nation state. Not every nation state is the same, uh, you know, and, and every, and, and of course you could say what happens in, in, in the book traces this, of course, in the second part, but what happens, you go from an Ottoman sort of ecumenical frame and even within the Ottomans, as I say, in the northern part, in the Balkans and in Anatolia, what happens is that the rise of ethno-religious nationalisms basically overwhelm and, and, and the defensiveness and the wars that take place overwhelm the ecumenical culture in the northern part of the empire. In other words, in the Balkans and Anatolia, 
which is why the Armenian question develops in the 1890s and the, the genocide takes place in World War I. In other words, it's at the very end of the empire that communities are turned into minorities and then are oppressed in the northern parts of the empires precisely because of these ethno-religious nationalisms and, and, and uh, the Ottoman state reaction to these. You see what I'm saying? So that's in, the, in our part of the world, we didn't, in the, in much that we didn't have that. There were no ethno-religious nationalisms fighting each other. There really wasn't, um, in, on, on any significant scale at least. And so what happens then in the post-Ottoman period is that the ecumenical frame then gets, gets sort of uh, um, uh, projected on or, or, or inhabits or becomes in a sense smaller because the space is no longer the Ottoman whole. It becomes Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. And in these places, of course, the same idea continues to an extent in the first half of the 20th century. So, but it becomes narrowed to within Lebanese, within Syrian, within Iraqi, within Egypt. And then you still have the ecumenical culture developing and continuing and persisting as people try to figure out how do you balance diversity in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in Egypt with uh, an overarching common national identity. So it's not that it has to be incompatible, but certain projects, uh, you know, are obviously militate against the idea of uh, of, uh, of diversity and, and equality. Okay, thank you so much, Osama. So I have a, a really a, a comment. So I thought it would be reading. In. This is to follow up uh, on Osama's point. People knew how they knew they lived in a diverse environment. My own research on Ottoman Tripoli, 18th century, to overwhelmingly show ordinary people, men and women, living side by side, interacting on a regular basis which is kind of the argument that we've seen in yeah. places like Aleppo, Damascus, and various other places sure. as well. Um, so uh, let me shift a little bit now to uh, the second half of the book. And here's where we go from this kind of incredibly diverse Ottoman Empire, linguistically, religiously, ethnically, uh, in every way you can imagine, this incredibly rich environment, this, including in uh, the Arab East, al mashriq to a point in which we uh, see the dissolution of the empire under the weight of World War One and uh, the colonial project by Britain and France, who come in directly or indirectly and they create, uh, or at least they they help to create what we know today as a modern Middle East, the nation state system as we understand it today. Uh, so I was kind of curious here that as some of the local elites in various places, whether it's Egypt, what we know today as Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, were engaged in this process of nation building themselves. I mean, this is right. not uh, the sort of omnipotent Europeans coming and we, the passive Arabs, just sit and take it. There's a very interesting dialectical relationship. But I'm kind of curious if you can talk a little bit about uh, how this process, you know, this process of the creation of a nation state and shifting from, you know, from an imperial kind of presence, but a diverse society to a nation state that is a lot more contracted geographically, but possibly also contracted in terms of who belongs and who doesn't. And uh, this idea, you know, and how do we shift? How does the ecumenical frame transition, if at all, into this new political system we call Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, or Egypt? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, again, that's a that's a huge question. <laughs> And you know, I, I can't do it justice in a few in a few minutes. But what I'll say is, first of all, just to go back two seconds, because I think we need to clarify for the listeners and for the audience. It's not that the Ottomans were just diverse and it was peaceful. I mean, there was a lot of violence in the 19th century. And as I said, the Ottoman state project ultimately was a state project. And when when equality and, and diversity and so on and, and pluralism got in the way of the state project, that diversity was was ultimately targeted and destroyed. And hence hence the persecution of the Armenians, hence the Greek-Turkish population exchange after World War I. In other words, it's, it's important to understand that, that that's what makes the Mashrat even more interesting because in contrast to what was happening in the northern part of the empire, we didn't face these ethno-religious um, um, dilemmas, uh, nationalist dilemmas in the 19th century. Uh, what, what, what happens, of course, uh, after the collapse of the empire uh, and the very brutal collapse uh, of, the, of the empire, is that the Europeans, of course, as you alluded to, the Europeans come in. And, and th this is where, again, the framing is so important because the ecumenical frame persists in the Arab East. The difference is that now it's not that the Europeans are omnipotent, but they do have an enormous amount of power because, of course, they do, they're the ones who, who draw the map of the modern Middle East. They're the ones who create the states of Syria, Lebanon, 
Palestine uh, uh, and Iraq. And of course, as you said, there is, of course, native agency and there's a dialectical relationship. There are people on the ground, there are elites on the ground who, who collaborate with the French and the British. But in the end, let's, not, let's be under no illusion as to who's actually drawing the, 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 the boundaries and the maps. And, and, and they're drawing them and they're separating what we were all under one sovereignty, suddenly we're divided up into multiple sovereignties. And, and the European conceit, and it really was a conceit, it's a racist conceit, it's a, a part and parcel of, of the European, both British and French thinking, since these are the two major powers that divided up the region, is that they really believed, they believed, this is the great tragedy, or, or the great sort of irony, or the, that, that somehow their history of pluralism in their own societies, despite the massive violence against Huguenots against Jews, against uh, there were no Muslims uh, on any major in France or in, or in, in England at the time. Um, uh, despite their colonial violence, despite their racism, all that they somehow felt that they had a right and an ability and a duty to sort of educate other peoples in the non-West about how to organize a pluralist society that could respect religious difference. That was their great conceit. In other words, in the West, you could have diversity and pluralism. In the East, the colonial powers insisted you could only have sectarianism and religious violence and hatreds that the Europeans needed to manage. And that was the great difference um, in this transition from the Ottoman to the post-Ottoman uh, 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 period. And so the European, the French, basically, and the British looked at the Middle East and they, they emphasized difference not to create a whole, but in fact, precisely to divide up this region into bits and pieces to control it better. We, we call it divide and rule until exactly what it was. That doesn't mean that, again, that the ecumenical frame disappeared. It just means it, it came under huge stress. And it had to sort of had to be adapted to, as you said, these separate nation states that get created, that get created for the interests of the imperial powers, not for the interests of the local populations. That's what I want to emphasize. And I think all the listeners need to, including, by the way, the creation of Lebanon. Yes, of course, there were elites in Lebanon who, in what would become Lebanon, who were, were willing to collaborate with the French. In fact, who enthusiastically collaborated with the French. Absolutely. The history is clear about this. But there were many people who were, of course, were opposed to that and, and who were ignored. And, and especially in the south and the Bukhara and the north uh, and on the, on the coastal regions. In fact, you could say the majority of the population, in fact, was not obviously consulted in the creation of Lebanon, but nevertheless, in the end, these states are created, and once they're created, they take on a life of their own, and then people have to make a choice, again, within the state, how do you identify? Uh, and what you see developing in, in every single Arab society in the Mashriq is a, uh, in fact, it's not the end of the ecumenical frame, it's in fact in reaction to the European discourse that you're uncivilized, you're always hating each other, you can't be independent, you need our tutelage, you need et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you see, in fact, the development of a huge array of political and social movements that includes the people you were talking about earlier, workers, peasants, um, uh, citizens of these states, uh, who, in fact, are adamant to prove, to disprove the European conceit that people in the East are only sectarian. So I, I think the ecumenical frame, in fact, thrives uh, even under European colonialism precisely as a response to the colonial claims that you need the European uh, man to, to sort of rule over the natives. And so, you, in fact, you see a flourishing in Egypt, in Syria, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Iraq, of, of, of ecumenical thought in, in, the, in the first half of the 20th century. It's in Palestine, of course, where the, where the catastrophe occurs, but that's, you know, and I talk about that in the book. Yeah, and we gotta, we, I, I do wanna get to that point in a second, but, uh... So uh, a couple questions, and we'll start with the first one, which probably is fairly straightforward to answer. Uh, at this point, you know, I mean, obviously, when we started out with Muslim Bustani setting up the first national school uh, in, in uh, certainly in, you know, in the area we know today as Lebanon, but, uh, you know, in, in the Mashriq, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of missionary schools that are also going on as well, obviously, uh, both in Egypt. In Iran, we see them in Turkey, but also in Lebanon and Syria. So I'm kind of curious as we shift to this nation state, you know, model of political uh, sovereignty, uh, where are we seeing sort of an effervescence or, 
an increase in augmentation in this kind of educational movement, you know, knowledge uh, develop production that is local, uh, that is also feeding into this ecumenical frame that you're talking yes, about? Absolutely, 100%. It, uh, there's an explosion of schools and voluntary societies and educational missions, both local and foreign, frankly, both. And the point is, again, because the point of the ecumenical frame is that there's an extraordinary diversity, also educational diversity, uh, in in the in the mushlip and of course there are different kinds of schools there are schools that cater to one community there are schools that, that are missionary schools there are schools that are um there was an ottoman state system belatedly set up at the end of the empire and there were schools like bustanis and sakakinis and other schools um, and there were women's schools and boys schools and girls schools and so on there was a whole range of schools and with just like in any in any diverse society with a diverse set of offerings and you would have to choose where you wanted to go and, and what opportunities were open to you to to because different schools had different emphases. The difference is that the missionary schools, by and large, had an agenda to ultimately convert, whether it's Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, or or shore up a communal sense of identity. Whereas the Bustani school, the national schools, not nationalist, but national schools. They they had the, the the goal of actually transcending religious difference, as opposed to all the other ones, which were about sort of reaffirming uh, religious uh, separatism or difference. So there was a there was a whole range of schools. Uh, so let, 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 you know, let me ask a little bit more about this uh, shifting ecumenical frame in the eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies. We talk you talked about Butosul Bustani, but then in chapter five, which is when you're shifting to this, you talk and you're focusing on Lebanon in this case. You talk a lot about Michel Shiha. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious if you could talk a little bit about him here and explain, you know, the role that you see for him in shaping or at least trying to shape a new type of Lebanon uh, with an ecumenical frame. Michel Shiha specifically? Um, well, in general, the group as a whole, but I mean, you focus well, I mean, on it's fascinating. I mean, because, you know, I have a, I have a PhD student or uh, she's no longer a PhD. She's, 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 she's uh, she finished her PhD, a former PhD student at Rice University by the name of Sima Farah, who's done this extraordinary work in the archives, in the French archives, to sort of unearth so many of these documents that we don't even know, I didn't know of, and certainly uh, most other people certainly don't know of, um, because so much of the history of Lebanon, like the history of Syria, um, is tied up to the French archive, the French sort of mandates and the creation of these of these mandates. and and. Um, so Shia himself and the, and the Lebanese elites, you know, I, I think you cannot separate their sort of agency from the fact that they're operating within a French colonial frame. Now we don't, again, we don't typically we talk about the mandates, we talk about Lebanon, we talk about Lebanese history, but we, you, ha I at least have to insist that we have to also sort of include it in part of, a, again, a dialectic within a French colonial sort of framework, because it's the French who ultimately create the the. the the boundaries and the borders, um, but within that there was a debate. Of course, uh, you know, once the French create the state, the question then is, and the French, of course, insist on having the ultimate say because it's a despotic system. Ultimately, whatever the Lebanese say is fine, but in the end, the French insisted on always maintaining the ultimate sort of ultimate authority, and and the French created the state in a way to separate it out from Syria um, as part of their whole vision of the East, which is that these are all antagon antagonistic religious communities that can't coexist. But then they create Lebanon. So having said that, within Lebanon, there was this debate. And the question is, how do you organize this, this state? And, and, and what role does religion or religious belonging or communalism have in, in politics? Should you create a secular state? Or should you create a state that actually, um, that actually sort of um, uh, institutionalizes uh, sectarian confessional belonging in politics and this was a huge debate and the interesting thing is that it was a debate from the very beginning of the creation of the state of Lebanon there were there was a debate and the interesting thing is that most people recognize uh, most people recognized including Shiha when he was pushed they recognized that 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 the ultimate goal should be a secular uh, um, state that actually transcends sectarian difference Everyone acknowledged that, or most people acknowledge that. The majority acknowledge that. But then Shia comes along with the French, of course, and under huge French pressure. And we still, as I said, we're still trying to, we're still, we're still basically trying to figure out the actual story itself, because there's so much we don't know. Um, but Shia basically comes along and justifies this idea of, of a, a Lebanese state that 
that temporarily acknowledges that in politics, in at least the member in parliament, in the Lebanese parliament, you should divide up, uh, you should, or in, in, in Lebanese parliament, you should divide up, um, you should create sectarian quotas to make sure that everybody has, every community has a sense of belonging to the whole. And then, of course, you have people on the other side who said, yeah, but if you do that, you're going to end up, you're going to end up reinforcing these these separatist sort of sectarian communal identities and that's going to defeat any any idea of, of ultimately transcending these identities into a Lebanese identity. Do you see what I'm saying? There's two two sides of that debate. Um, the French ultimately come down on the side of the sectarians and they and they 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 create the system to play one off the other, uh, I think, uh, and ultimately with the idea that they are the arbiters. And so that's what happens in Lebanon and, and that's the debates that take place. But the point is, it's not just the Christians, it's Muslims, Christians, and, uh, and Druze, and all the other communities in Lebanon who have people on both sides of the debate, both for and against the sectarian system. But in the end, the sectarian system is entrenched in Lebanon politically, as you know. Uh, but the interesting thing, it's entrenched politically, but always with this, with this caveat, because they know that it's a dangerous system. And with the caveat that this is a temporary system and that eventually it should be it should give way to a secular sense of belonging so they understood that the, what, what they were doing was incredibly sort of dangerous and lebanon is the only state i know that keeps saying yes the system we have we're putting in it's a temporary system and eventually it's going to go away uh, and the fact that they have to say that tells you that they recognize that they were part of a debate uh so we are running quickly out of time, much as I would love to continue. We have about six minutes left. So there is one last thing that I want to say, if we can briefly address it, because in some ways you argue that that's the end of the ecumenical frame or not completely, man. I don't mean to sound so dramatic, but certainly it's with the rise of the uh, Zionist project in, that in Palestine, yeah. that all of a sudden what we had talked about within the Arab East, certainly within al uh comes to, you know, a rude awakening that there's the system that completely juxtaposes itself against it, which is really, an, you know, ethno-religious national system Correct. that completely rejects any idea of ecum uh, ecumenical behavior. So I, I'm kind of wondering, uh, you know, if you can talk briefly about that. And well, there's contrasted with the Lebanese system right there. I mean, people often like compare the Lebanese system with the, with the Zionist system, but the reality is that Lebanon has a sectarian system, but it's not the state of the Christians. It's not formally the state of the Christians. It's not legally the state of the Christians. And, and so I think that's a crucial distinction. Lebanon, in the end, is able to co-opt Muslim and Druze and other elites uh, as part of the system of rule. Whereas in Palestine, as, as you just said, the Zion, Zionism, and as I, as I argue in the book, the Zion, you just have to look and see where, where do all the major Zionist thinkers of the 19th century come from? They're all coming from Europe. They're answering European questions. They're answering, they're dealing with European anti-Semitism. They're, they're, they're part of a European... Uh, history and culture um, in terms of thinking about, so they want to create a Jewish state. Okay, where do they put the Jewish state in Palestine? What about the indigenous population? Well, indigenous populations in European thinking in the 19th century don't count, don't count nearly as much. And the idea of creating an ethno-religious nationalist project, a Jewish state in a multi-religious world, whether it's in Palestine, had it been in Syria, it would have had the same consequences, or Lebanon, it would have had the same consequences exactly. The idea of implanting an, a, a project which emerges in Europe, answering European questions, and then imposing it on a multi-religious part of the world, inevitably was uh, catastrophic, as, as, as we've seen, as we see until today, right? I mean, so that's very different from, from the ecumenical sort of frame I was talking about in, in Lebanon and in Palestine, in Syria, in Egypt, and other, where there are debates within about what constitutes you know, where do you draw the line between secular and religious? These are always ongoing debates. Should you have a sectarian system or a secular system? These are a national system. These are all debates, but it wasn't that the state is only for one group or one people. And that is that is truly, truly uh, dangerous. This idea of fusing in a multi-religious part of the world, the idea that the national national project only belongs to one religion or one group. No, that has hugely damaging consequences. The interesting thing is that the Palestinians, in response to the rise of Zionism, which of course, I mean, they were, they were it's important to, to say this, Dr. There, there, of course, there were, there were many Jews uh, in Palestine who, were, who saw this as a problem, who understood the problem, and eventually said, we can't support this project because this, is not, this doesn't represent Judaism, and so on and so forth. And these, these voices and figures also need to be 
respected. And and so uh, and what happens is that um, the Palestinians, in response to the catastrophe of the Nakba of 1948, is that you see quite interesting that Palestinian movement develops uh, along Muslim Christian lines of solidarity, which itself draws on the earlier history of the ecumenical frame from the 19th century, before Zionism emerged and before Palestinian identity in its modern form emerged either. So we have one last question. It's a big question, but I, I, I would like to ask it. Uh, and it's kind of a more forecasting rather than looking back question. Uh, and the question is, I assume that you're talking about the historical ecumenical frame because you want to emphasize that it's still possible today. Yes, of course. I mean, history, I mean, everything changes. The point about history and the, the point about, about being a historian is that it's not just like an interest in the past. It's an interest in the past because we believe ultimately, so I, at least I'll speak for myself, because I believe that we can, we, we have this extraordinary rich history and we need to reconstitute the, 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 the present and the future drawing on elements of our past. And you see what I'm saying? So the question, but of course, it's, there is, a, there is an argument, you, you pick and choose what you want to emphasize. Right. And, and ideally you can, you can see that we have an extraordinarily rich history um, that, as I said, has been denigrated, has been denied, has been orientalized. Um, you know, is, that is scarcely recognizable today. When you look back today, all you see are broken states, destroyed societies, um, and well, that's a function of, 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 of mid to late 20th century politics and history, and the decisions that have been make, taken both by Western powers and also by, by, um, by local rulers. But, so the yeah. hard part of the question is, do you have any suggestions for ways in which this idea of the ecumenical frame can be put into effect today in Lebanon, for example? Yes, read, read the histories. I mean, the point is like understand, the most important thing is consciousness understand that we do have this history and this heritage that we're not tied to being you know sectarian or you know just i'm saying i mean and the, and the current system in lebanon in any case is collapsed as we all know i mean lebanon now is in a state of complete collapse the sectarian system is a complete uh, um um you know is in complete sort of downfall right now so uh, i think inevitably there's going to have to be a reimagination if we want a, a better future but that's not that's not for me alone obviously well, Osama, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for taking so much of your very overwhelmed schedule to be with us today. Uh, and we appreciate you really being here. Uh, I apologize if we didn't get some of the questions you asked. Uh, but hopefully we have been able to shed some light on the 19th century and early 20th century period in Arab Lebanese history, where many in Bilal Sham began to imagine, discuss and implement a new and secular political order to replace the old Ottoman system as we talk. Uh, you can sign up for our uh, newsletter and uh, follow us on our social media. And if you'd like to stay informed about future events, speaking of which, this webinar series, uh, we will continue next month and we will be with Dr. Nadia Smaiti, who will be talking about the history of education uh, in Lebanon at that time period. And we will share with you the time and uh, date for that. Uh, we uh, also we will publish this uh, video within the next two weeks as on the Kerala Center's YouTube channel. We'll also provide this audio as part of a podcast series related to our mission at the Kerala Center. You can listen to those episodes on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and we are only able to host these events and continue our mission and work with the help of our donors. If you have enjoyed this webinar, and this is one of those shameless plugs for support, uh, please consider donating. Uh, you just have to turn your phone on to the QR code, uh, you know, five, 10, $25 a month by sharing with us. And uh, thank you again, Osama, for taking your time to be with us today. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.